It's now my pleasure to introduce award-winning author and scholar Nathaniel Philbrick. Nat was, in his early life, an all-American collegiate sailor, driven to succeed under sail by fierce competition from his brother, father, and most especially his mother. He went on to become one of our foremost writers of stormy seas, penning In the Heart of the Sea, a winner of the National Book Award that Hollywood just adopted for the big screen, Roosevelt Naval History Prize winner Sea of Glory, and New York Times bestseller Mayflower. He has been heralded for his talent at bringing history to life with the novelist's touch. In his newest work, Valiant Ambition, George Washington, Benedict Arnold, and the Fate of the American Revolution, he offers a surprising and complex account of the tragic, almost Shakespearean relationship between the greatest war hero and greatest war villain of the young, of the young United States. The Boston Globe says, Valiant Ambition may be one of the greatest what-if books of the age, a volume that turns one of America's best-known narratives on its head, arguing that what is taught in schools consists of the facts, but not the broader truth. And so Philbrick asks, what if Benedict Arnold's treason was not an act that split the nation, but instead was the glue that bound it together and saved it? We are so pleased to have him here with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Nathaniel Philbrick back to the Free Library. And it's really great to be here in Philadelphia because this city figures so large in this book. I think, you know, when most people think of the revolution, yes, we know that the Declaration of Independence uh, was, was produced here, but that's where, pretty much where it ends when it comes to, to the revolution in, in many people's uh, uh, mind. But the truth of the matter is Philadelphia was the center of it uh, throughout a war that uh, went on for eight long years. And the Continental Congress uh, was, was an absolutely pivotal part of it. And it was not a complacent place. Uh, it was riven with all sorts of controversy and, and conflict. And what I wanted to do with this book, my per previous book, uh, Bunker Hill, obviously talked about the outbreak of the revolution in Boston with Washington as a, and I knew I wanted to follow Washington uh, in, into the re middle period of the revolution. And I was quite aware that, you know, it, we think of the revolution as sort of stepping stones to victory, each battle as, as a part of a God-ordained uh, uh, march to victory. And it wasn't that way at all. Um, the, the, after the passage of the Declaration of Independence and uh, the Battle of Saratoga in 1777 with the entry of the France, French, it was assumed, hey, we've won this thing. But in the years that followed, the alliance with France did almost nothing to help America win the war. The Continental Congress did not have the ability to tax the American people directly. It did not have the funds to, to keep a war and an army going. And um, it seemed as if much of the fervor that had launched us in this revolution had been lost by the American people. And many officers in Washington's army became uh, very embittered. It was, seemed like it was all winding down. And, and adding to the problems were that instead of fighting the British, uh, Americans were putting much more energy into fighting themselves. Here in Philadelphia, uh, it was a, a question of radical constitutionalists. Uh, here in Philadelphia, you had uh, the most radical constitution uh, in the states, uh, where uh, you were ruled by a, a, the legislative body, no governor, and uh, there were no checks and balances, so the majority ruled. And, and uh, what happened was the, the lower orders were now in charge, and now the well-to-do uh, uh, aristocrats, uh, the Quakers, were a minority. And, uh, and since particularly in the Quakers' position where they could not uh, sign on the dotted line when it came to a loyalty oath, they found themselves persecuted uh, by, by in, in Philadelphia. And uh, around New York, there, uh, British occupied New York, uh, there was the neutral ground to the north of New York in Westchester County where gangs of, of uh, so-called patriots, uh, known as Skinners, would duke it out with gangs of, of loyalists, uh, known as cowboys, in what was a true cat and dog fight, as neighbor preyed upon neighbor and turned uh, the eastern edge of the Hudson River into a virtual wasteland. People left their houses. Uh, 
farms were left to follow. Uh, the the uh, coast of New, New Jersey and, and Long Island also became scenes of, of what were no, historians have called the whale boat wars, where uh, displaced refugees from uh, uh, New Jersey and Long Island would, would launch their whale boats and on Viking-like raids on their former neighbors, uh, literally rape and pillage uh, their former towns and then return and then, and then it would, there would be reprisals and this was going on. And so I, I knew this was uh, kind of the dark truth of the revolution that I wanted to get at, but how to bring it to life. And I had Washington but who else would I focus on? Well, that's when I thought of my mother. <laughs> my mother was uh, a, 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 a wonderful woman, a, a, a kind of a renegade. She really enjoyed uh, going her own way. Hey, she smoked a pipe, uh, uh, which was quite something when you were a teenager uh, eating at a restaurant when she would light up. <laughs> but she was fascinated with Benedict Arnold. I think she really enjoyed the audacity of the man. And she would lecture my brother and I on, you know, he, got a, he didn't get a fair shake. And, you know, I was a teenager said, yeah, mom, Benedict Arnold, you know, to be called Benedict Arnold was the worst thing you could be possibly, you know, cast as. And so, you know, I sort of shrugged then, but then, of course, when I'm trying to figure out this book, I say, hey, hmm, you know, maybe mom had something. And, she, and now I'm here before you today that, to tell you that my mom was right. Benedict Arnold, we like to think of him as the you know, evil incarnate from the start who hid his nefarious ways until they were revealed with his traitorous, traitorous behavior uh, in, in October of 1780 when he tried to turn over West Point to the British. But the fact of the matter is, in the first three years of the war, he was our best battlefield commander. I mean, what he, uh, he, he was a, an apothecary and seagoing merchant out of New Haven. And he had a small fleet of trading ships and where he would run down to the Caribbean, up to the St. Lawrence, and so he, was, he knew Quebec, Montreal very well. And he was very familiar with the corridor of water that extends from New York up the Hudson River a short jog over to the river-like length of Lake Champlain, and then extends all the way along the Richelieu River into the St. Lawrence. Now, you know, today we drive around on multi-lane highways, and, and I know there's a tendency when you see a fort by a river, you go, you know, why did they build this fort here? And the fact of the matter is, before there were multi-lane highways, overland travel, uh, in America was very slow and cumbersome. The only way to move an army, the only way to move a significant number of goods was by water. And this wa corridor of water uh, had the potential, if the British should ever seize it, they would be able to seal New England off from the rest of the states and basically win the war. And uh, Arnold recognized this. And when he first heard about Lexington and Concord, he went to Boston. And he says, you know what you need to do? You need to take Fort Ticonderoga, the southern part of Lake Champlain. It's an absolutely essential strategic point, and it also has a bunch of cannons that could come in helpful at some point. Uh, he would, uh, Massachusetts empowered him to do that. Others had the same idea, and Arnold would go side by side with Ethan Allen and take Ticonderoga. While Ethan and Allen and the Green Mountain Boys got drunk on the British liquor supply, Arnold would commandeer a sloop, sail up the length of Lake Champlain, and take, take British-held St. John's, where there was a small outpost of soldiers. What, what vessels he could not commandeer, he burned and destroyed. And now America had command of Lake Champlain, an absolutely essential. And you know, he did this in the first months of the war. By that summer, his wife had died, leaving him a widower with three children. His uh, wife, his the sister Hannah, would take care of them in New Haven while he went to Boston, where George Washington was now the commander of the Continental Army, and he was mired in what would be a nine-month siege. Washington says, we've got some options up north. The British had been taken aback uh, by the outbreak of the Revolution and only had a small groups of soldiers in Quebec and Montreal, and there was a possibility at the early stage of the conflict to take those two cities, and we'd have Canada. And uh, so uh, as Richard Montgomery went up 
Lake Champlain to take Montreal, Washington sent Arnold and a ragtag band of, of soldiers that included none other than Aaron Burr, a very young Aaron Burr, uh, the Virginia rifleman, Daniel Morgan, and his regiment of riflemen. And you know, it's fall, it's getting cold, it's beginning to snow and freeze, and they go up the Penobscot River, uh, and then go, I've, I've, my wife and I have driven the route uh, Arnold took through the Maine wilderness. There's still nothing up there. If there's a road, it's called, has Arnold uh, involved in the name. And he would lose close, close to a third of his men to desertion and, and disease and death. But finally, they would make it to Quebec. He would not be able to initially dislodge the British, uh, but for that feat, he became known as the American Hannibal. You know, and he did this in the first year. Eventually, he and Montgomery would team up and storm Quebec in a snowstorm uh, right around Christmas at the end of the year. Uh, Montgomery would be killed in the early going. Uh, Arnold would, would uh, be injured uh, by the ricocheted bullet in his left leg. It would not be successful. Uh, Arnold, however, would be able to recover and, and be, play a crucial ro role in the British retreat, the American retreat, down Lake Champlain to Fort Ticonderoga. Now my book begins, chapter one, with Washington in New York uh, in the summer of 1776. The British have evacuated Boston, but now they have their sights set on New York. And that summer, a British armada of more than 400 warships and troop transports 40,000 men, more people than the population of Philadelphia, which was the biggest urban center in, in the colonies, in, which is now about to become the United States. I mean, this is like the War of the Worlds, when this huge force of overpowering strength arrives at your front door. Uh, they were anchored along the west shore of Staten Island, um, and, you know, this Brit would, would be not until World War I would Britain mount a larger force. I mean, this was just amazing stuff. And Washington was there with, you know, his, his Continental Army, um, many of them militiamen, uh, ill-trained against a crack professional force that included quite a number of professional Hessian soldiers. It would not go well for Washington. Now we think of Washington as, as sort of the Washington on the dollar bill, um, you know, stayed a, a, a patient pragmatist. But Washington in the beginning of the revolution was not like this. He was in his early 40s, red haired, extremely passionate, and by temperament, very aggressive. Uh, in Boston, he had desperately wanted to attack the city and dislodge the occupying British. It might have burned the city to the ground. He might have destroyed his own army, but he wanted to end this with one fell swoop. And his, uh, his uh, council of war refused his repeated attempts to do just that. But now that he was uh, in New York, uh, he was going to give the British a fight, even though the, their navy had command of the waters and uh, uh, Howe would uh, launch his, land his force on Long Island while Washington's army was in the high ground in Brooklyn, or what we now call Brooklyn Heights. William Howe was the British commander, and he would completely outgeneral Washington in the Battle of Long Island. It was a humiliating defeat. Washington would eventually be forced to retreat to New York uh, at night across the East River, and then eventually forced to retreat from New York into the Harlem, in, into the Harlem Heights. The British now had New York. They had their foothold on that quarter of water north. And as William Howe knew, there was another large invasionary force coming down from Canada, down the Richelieu River to Lake Champlain. If they should take Fort Ticonderoga, the game would be up. The British would have it. And the only thing between the British and accomplishing that was Benedict Arnold and a fleet of 15 vessels. They were more like rowboats with a mast on them, uh, floating platforms for cannons. Many of them built that summer, hacked out of the trees along the southern edge of Lake Champlain. And Arnold was up there with this ragtag fleet 
uh, waiting for this vast armada that included a three, three-masted British ship with 18 cannons, several schooners, more than 20 gunboats, troop transports, thousands of soldiers, and a large Native American contingent. What was he going to do? Well, in October of 1776, the British began down the, river, down the lake in a strong northerly breeze. Arnold knew it was going to be a northerly that was going to bring them. And so he had hid his men inside Valcour Island, just a few miles below what's now Plattsburgh, New York. He let the British sail past him, and then once they had gone by, he sort of stuck out his head and said, hey, here we are, uh, forcing the British to sail upwind to come after him. What Arnold, it was brilliant. What Arnold had done had achieved what mariners called the weather gauge. It's kind of the sailor's equivalent of taking the high ground in battle. The British now had to sail up to him. And what this meant was this great big battleship that they had built uh, could not sail against the wind. It had square sails. And so Arnold had succeeded in taking out their, their most dangerous foe. What would ensue was an eight hour slugfest as Arnold's 15 vessels lined up along the entrance to the bay of Val Valcor Bay would slug it out with more than 20 gunboats. By the end of it, both sides had inflicted terrible damage on each other. One gunboat had literally been blown out of the water. One of Arnold's gondolas had been sunk. It's now um, uh, uh, it's now part of the Museum, American History Museum of the Smithsonian the Philadelphia, appropriately named. Uh, and it was fun, it's great, when they brought it up, there was a cannonball still wedged inside the bow. Uh, but they had fought them to a draw, night came. The British say, we've got him. Come morning, there's, he's got no way out. Arnold, at night, has a quick uh, talk with his officers, and he says, do you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna... Uh, no, pretty much no one can hear anything because they're all deaf after eight hours of firing cannons. And he says, we're going to slip through. There's a little gap between the most inland of the America, uh, British ships. We're going to sail through that gap and escape. That's exactly what they would do. And eventually, after another battle with the British uh, so in the southern portion of Lake Champlain, they would make it to, to uh, Fort Ticonderoga. Now, the British commander Carleton was like, what is this whirling dervish of an American force? Uh, and he, and the, he came down to Ticonderoga, he looked at his calendar and said, well, you know, it's getting kind of late. I think we're gonna save this to next year. Arnold had done it. He had prevented the British from taking Fort Ticonderoga and his country could live another year. And so this book begins with Arnold, the future traitor at his height, Washington, who will become the one man capable of holding this country together at his lowest point. And it traces what happens to them in the intervening years. Washington would, um, would you know, we, he would make the miraculous comeback at Trenton when he crosses the Delaware on Christmas uh, of that year. Um, at, America was at its lowest ebb. He tr succeeds in, in surprising the British and turning things around. You know, we, we focus on that magnificent accomplishment, and it really was. But, you know, we fail sometimes to appreciate the circumstances under which Washington was, was working. You know, his officer, many of his officers, instead of helping him at his lowest moment, were conspiring against him. His, uh, his adjutant general, Joseph Reed, a Philadelphia lawyer, uh, had been with Washington since Boston, and uh, it was in November, before just the, a, a month before the crossing of the Delaware. They're they're beleaguered in in New Jersey. They're they're just getting the British are, are relentlessly chasing them across the state. And he opens some correspondence for his ad, adjutant general, and it's a letter from Charles Lee, the second in command of the American army, and he discovers that his adjutant general has been in correspondence with Lee, basically complaining about Washington's indecisiveness and telling him that what he should do is that winter form a new army, basically saying, uh, you know, Washington's washed up. We, I, we th I think you should be uh, the leader. And this was a devastating blow to Washington. And this is where you begin to see Washington's political savvy. Instead of getting 
openly angry to read. He resealed, resealed the letter and attached an accompanying letter in which he said, I, in, I thinking this letter for, was uh, for the headquarters staff, I opened it, but I realized uh, this letter was of a different sort. My apologies. <laughs> That's all he said. And he left Joseph Reed twisting in the icy emptiness of his withheld wrath. Um, and, and then when it comes to, to just the night that they're going to cross the Delaware, by this time Horatio Gates, who'd been uh, in charge of the army at Fort Ticonderoga, uh, Arnold's commanding officer, had made his way down from Fort Ticonderoga because the British had turned around and gone back up to, to Canada. Horatio Gates comes down and, and Washington says, it's great to have you here, can you help me out here? And, and Gates says, no, I don't feel too well. I think I'm gonna go to Philadelphia. And, um, and by this time, the Continental Congress, fearing the British were gonna storm across the river, had fled to Baltimore. Somehow, Gates has the energy to continue to Baltimore, uh, where he knows if Washington's desperate attempt to turn this war around fails, as everyone assumed it would, he would be perfectly positioned to be Take, take over. And so this was the kind of thing Washington was operating under. Uh, after, uh, after all this, uh, in the winter of 1777, Arnold, who is now stationed in Providence, uh, hoping to attack the British who have taken Newport, is waiting expectantly to hear that he has been elevated to, to major general. He's the top rank, ranking brigadier and no one has come close to his accomplishments. He learns to his amazement, in fact, it's Washington that informs him that con the Continental Congress, who are, who are the ones who appoint major generals, because remember, this is, we are fighting to, uh, for a republic, and uh, the, a civil government uh, has to have command of the military. And, and every other previous revolution, uh, the revolution after the revolution broke out, in the chaos after that, the military had co-opted the government and a dictator had emerged, whether it was Caesar or Cromwell and in the future years, Napoleon. And this is, they had a very legitimate fear. And, uh, and so they didn't, they, the fact that Washington had come back with such bravery at Trenton meant that, um, you know, that they feared that he was now gaining almost a monarchical status. And so they insisted on control determining his major generals, and it was said that each state should have two major generals, and since Connecticut didn't have, already had two, the, oh, Benedict Arnold, who was from that state, would be overlooked, and five uh, brigadiers who were below him in rank were elevated past him. And this was just unimaginable from uh, Arnold's state, and Washington was, was almost apoplectic about it, but there was little they could do. Arnold was upset, but he, he hung in there. Eventually, uh, he would be there at Saratoga, where once again, Horatio Gates was his commanding officer. By this time, Gates made it clear uh, he, he was concerned about Arnold's, uh, that Arnold might steal his thunder. Uh, there are really two battles in the Battle of Saratoga, and uh, after the first one, Gates and Arnold had a falling out. It really had been Arnold's soldiers that had fought the British to a, a draw that had had really devastated them. They were, it was really the American wilderness that was defeating the British. They had crossed, they had taken Fort Ticonderoga, they had crossed the Hudson, where they were knocking on Albany's door, but they had run out of provisions. As militiamen from New England and riflemen from, New, from Virginia swarmed into um, the Saratoga region and were about to take him. Ar Arnold gets dismissed from the Ar Northern Army. Uh, he, Gates have, and he has such a falling out. And in the second battle, the climactic battle, Arnold, even though he's not part of the army, appears on the battlefield. A tremendously charismatic figure. Uh, soldiers, almost by magnetic process, clustered around him. And towards the end of things, with the sun coming down, he realizes that there's a key redoubt. If he can charge through two lines of fire, go through the back sally port and take the redoubt, they will have them. So he heads out, you know, just this incredibly brave, rash maneuver with some people following him, others attacking the redoubt from the other side. He comes to the opening of the sally port. He's on his horse, raises his, 
his sword and commands them to surrender. A German soldier raises his musket, fires. It hits the same leg that he had injured in Quebec, kills the horse. The horse collapses on top of him, pinning him down. His old friend, Henry Dearborn, who had gone up to Quebec with him, is the first one as at his side. And he says to Arnold, uh, are you hurt badly? And Arnold says, in the same leg, I wish the musket ball had gone through my heart. And uh, I think if he had late in life, he could have looked back. Uh, and if he had died then, he would have been one of our great he American heroes. Uh, he was devastated not only by this injury, but by his treatment by Gates. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of how his long slide in, uh, to, into uh, treachery. That's why you have to read the book. <laughs> but I will say, it was his time here in Philadelphia uh, as military governor of Philadelphia that really pushed him over the edge. Joseph Reed, remember him? Washington's former adjutant, was now a uh, uh, president of the executive council of the state legislature. And uh, he, he conducted what was a virtual witch hunt uh, for Arnold. Arnold was no choir boy. By this time, he had lost uh, much of his personal wealth, wealth he had used to help fight the revolution in the early going. And he had decided, it's time I made some money. And so he used his position as military governor to um, put together some uh, deals that were a little shady. Uh, he, they were secret. Reed had no evidence, but this did not prevent Reed from conducting uh, a virtual witch hunt. And Arnold found himself in the middle of this and was angry and bewildered, but hey, he fell in love. He was a widower, and at 36, he met 18-year-old Peggy Shippen. And uh, Peggy, during the British occupation of Philadelphia, had uh, met, had sp she and her sisters had socialized with uh, uh, the British officers, one of whom was the very handsome Major John Andre, who had done a beautiful sketch of her, and she was a lovely woman. And as eventually she and Arnold would become married, and she was a family that had royal connections prior to the revolution. They were trying to straddle the political fence. But um, she definitely had loyalist leanings, and within a month of their marriage, Arnold would send his first letter uh, co uh, co correspondence to no none other than John Andre, who is now the head of the British spy network in New York. And thus would begin the correspondence that would ultimately lead to Arnold's um, uh, managing to get himself command of West Point and attempting to turn it over the British. It would be foiled uh, when after a midnight meeting with John Andre, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Andre comes up the Hudson River in a ship called the Vulture, <laughs> anchors in Haverstraw Bay. Uh, Arnold that night sends a, a rowboat out to pick him up. Uh, Andre is, is brought to the shore on the West Bank. They meet at night in the trees. Arnold gives him uh, all sorts of documents relating to West Point. They agree on a price. And remember, Arnold, Arnold believed he was doing this for the good of his country, that America had fallen apart, uh, that the best thing for the American people, uh, you know, we had blown it. Uh, the best thing was to bring the British back. But that did not prevent him from do doing it for top dollar. And so they agreed upon a price. And the next morning, uh, Andre was about to head out back to the, uh, the vulture when an American officer, unknown to Arnold, fires a cannon upon the vulture, forcing it down the river. Now Andre has no way to escape. He's forced to make his way down the east coast, east bank of the Hudson through that neutral ground I was telling you about. This is the territory of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle. And, you know, and it's, he's in Terrytown when out of the shadows come three men holding muskets. And one of them has a Hessian Jaeger jacket on. Andre says, oh, great. Finally, the British, I'm, I'm home free. And he says, hey, you know, good to see you guys. And they say, hey, come off your horse. And it's revealed that these are three militiamen. And the one with the Hessian coat had been uh, a prisoner in New York and using that coat to escape. Uh, Arnold's plot was revealed. Arnold would uh, be able to flee down the Hudson when it after telling Peggy of what was going to happen. She was in his headquarters in a house about a, a mile below West Point. 
He would escape to, to New York. She would eventually, uh, uh, and it was then that Washington would appear. Washington, who had been Arnold's biggest supporter, uh, who had no idea this was coming. Nobody had any idea. He hears, uh, his, he's, he's got Hamilton with him, Lafayette, Henry Knox. They've just met with the French in Hartford. He comes to Arnold's headquarters expecting to get a tour of West Point, learns that his best battlefield commander has tried to do this. And he turns to Lafayette, who has become a surrogate son to him, and says, whom can we trust now? And, um, and the amazing thing was that word of Arnold's treason had a riveting effect to the nation. Here in Philadelphia, Charles Wilson Peale created a, 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 a a whole a, a effigy of Arnold that was paraded through the streets of, of Philadelphia, and he was where he was burned to cinders. And this was going on in cities up and down the East Coast. And it was a wake-up call to America that you know the the true threat to America was not from the British; it was from ourselves. And uh, I'd like to end uh, by reading a few paragraphs from the epilogue, because the great tragedy when it comes to Arnold, is that in the first years of the war, there was no one short of Washington who did more for the American cause. But it was as a traitor that he succeeded in beginning to pull it together a nation. Uh, uh, and, and in the end, no one short of Washington did more for America, even though he'd done it as a traitor. You know, I think it's no accident that within a year of all this, Yorktown would come to pass. And so, I'll end with this. The United States had been created through an act of disloyalty. No matter how eloquently the Declaration of Independence had attempted to justify the American rebellion, residual guilt hovered over the circumstances of the country's founding. Arnold changed all that. By threatening to destroy the newly created republic through, ironically, his own betrayal, Arnold gave this nation of traitors the greatest of gifts, a myth of creation. The American people had come to revere George Washington, but a hero alone was not sufficient to bring them together. Now they had the despised Benedict Arnold. They knew both what they were fighting for and against. The story of America's genesis could finally move beyond the break with the mother country and start to focus on the process by which, by which 13 former colonies could become a nation. As Arnold had demonstrated, the real enemy was not Great Britain, but those Americans who sought to undercut their fellow citizens' commitment to one another. Whether it was Joseph Reed's willingness to promote his state's interest at the expense of what was best for the country as a whole, or Arnold's decision to sell his loyalty to the highest bidder, the greatest danger to America's future came from self-serving opportunism masquerading as patriotism. At this fragile stage in the country's development, a way had to be found to strengthen rather than destroy the existing framework of government. The Continental Congress was far from perfect, but it offered a start to what would, could one day be a great nation. By turning traitor, Arnold had alerted the American people to how close they had all come to betraying the revolution by putting their own interests ahead of their newborn countries. Already, the name Benedict Arnold was becoming a byword for that most hateful of crimes, treason against the people of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Washington allowed Peggy Ship and Arnold to escape justice. Yeah, well, um, our, Washington, at the time, it was believed that Peggy uh, was an innocent bystander in all this, that, uh, uh, that Arnold, uh, yeah, you know, she didn't know anything about this until the very end. And, uh, and what she had done is, uh, a few hours after Arnold left her and, and made his way down the Hudson, she went into a, a kind of hysterical fit. And she had bouts of hysteria throughout her life. And, um, but it was, it, it seems to have been pretty well calculated because it completely uh, captivated all the officers there. She insisted that she needed to see Washington, who came up. Hamilton uh, was completely uh, won over by this, calling her as innocent as the lamb. And you know, here she was in her 
in her negligee in the bed, um, you know, and they were, all these officers were very willing to sit by her side and, and console her throughout all this. And, um, and Washington, she was given the option to either join Arnold in New York or return to Philadelphia. And interestingly, she opted to go back to her family. She did that, but Philadelphia did not want Peggy Shippen in Philadelphia. And so she was uh, forced, her father uh, took her to New British New York. And can you imagine this reunion when she and their young son uh, crossed the Hudson and she was reunited with Arnold? It must have been a very interesting conversation. But within a couple of months, she would be pregnant with their second child. And, um, and so that's what happened to Peggy. When it came to Arnold, it's, Washington's reaction is, is amazing. Um, you know, initially, all his officers around him were apoplectic with, with rage and disbelief. Uh, Henry Knox wrote to Nathaniel Green, I cannot get Arnold out of my head. And, um, and at one point, um, an officer wrote to Washington saying, I'm sure Arnold is suffering through, you know, his mind is, is raging at what he has done. Because now he was a traitor. You know, a traitor is a traitor, no matter which side you are on. But as, as Washington said, no, it won't, Arnold isn't like that. He doesn't look back. Um, uh, he will have no regrets. And that's true. Arnold was someone who lived in the moment. Uh, there was a, a lot of art narcissism in, in uh, Arnold. And, and so he was, he was perfectly capable of convincing himself what was good for him was good for the country. But Washington, and Washington in a letter to Rochambeau, is very philosophical. He says, you know, you know this is upsetting, but it's kind of amazing something like this hasn't already happened given the circumstances of our rebellion. But that did not prevent Washington by taking a very personal interest in making sure Arnold came to justice. Uh, working through uh, the cavalry uh, officer, uh, light horse Harry Lee, would pick one of his officers who would uh, pose as a, as a deserter, who would go to New York claiming to Arnold that he had been inspired by Arnold's changing sides and he wanted to serve with him. And Arnold had been hopeful that a whole group of loyalists would come out of the woodwork and, and rally around him, and that was not happening. And, um, and so, but this guy was able to infiltrate himself into Arnold and got quite close to Arnold. And Washington did not want Arnold assassinated. He wanted Arnold captured, uh, brought out of uh, New York, and, and hanged as a traitor. Um, uh, and so the plan was this guy had followed Arnold, realized that every night about midnight he would walk around the house, go out to the outhouse, and then you know, check the grounds and then go to bed. And so he was out there waiting for him in early December, had uh, moved the fence so that once he got him, knocked him out, and drag, this was a very big guy. Uh, he would then drag him to the, the Hudson River where a boat was waiting and they'd row out and he had, it was all set. And it was that day that uh, Henry Clinton, the British commander, decided to send Arnold to Virginia. And so it didn't happen. And, and so Washington, uh, Arnold would then go down to Virginia and do what Arnold does best. Uh, he uh, was, uh, worked his way up the James River, burning everything as he went along. Richmond was in flames. Soon Jefferson, was flee who was governor of the state, was fleeing Monticello. And what does Ar uh, Wa uh, Washington do? He sends Lafayette to go get him. I won't go into the rest of it because that's what I'm going to talk about in the next book. Could you share just a bit with us about the sources you were able to consult about Benedict Arnold? What documentation still exists and where, perhaps on the internet, but if you went in person, where would you go to find it? Yeah, well, you know, there, there are archives all over the place where there are Benedict Arnold uh, letters, but there is a true treasure trove at the Clements Library on the uh, campus of the University of Michigan. Uh, this is a library that specializes in American Revolution documents. And in the early 20th century, they were able to secure Henry Clinton's papers. And, um, you know, and up until this time, everyone assumed Peggy was innocent, right? Well, these, uh, the Clinton papers contain the correspondence between Arnold and Andre. 
And when you read those coded letters, I mean, they're just fascinating. They're coded letters, and then you see where the British would decode them, and they go back and forth, and it becomes clear that Peggy is right there with him. Um, uh, and, and there had been, uh, uh, at one point, uh, after on, when she was on her way to Philadelphia, she stopped off in New Jersey and spoke to a well-known uh, loyalist uh, who, who um, and, and according to the loyalist, let her guard down and said, you know, it took me a year to get Arnold to do this, and this is, you know, here I am trying to, you know, go through all this theatrics, but uh, you know, she was just weary and uh, no one believed her, uh, partly because it was Aaron Burr who spread the rumor. Uh, but it, it's, these documents really bore the fact that you know, she was not only uh, there, but she, when Arnold had to travel from Philadelphia, she was the conduit for the correspondence. And um, so, so that, those, those documents were of, of huge importance. Thank you for a very great talk tonight. Um, I'm watching the show turn. I'm sure a lot of the people in the audience are. I was wondering how you felt about the accuracy of how they're portraying the story. Well, I've been asked that a lot, and I hate to, hate to say, but I've never seen it. Um, when I, last year, when I was writing this book, uh, Turn came out, it was it last spring, right? And, um, and I realized, you know, I just, I have to, I'm writing this book based on my engagement with the primary materials. I did not need to have you know, that kind of, uh, of uh, things competing with that. And so I, I purposely did not see it, um, which is hard because that's what everybody is talking about. And, but I, I did read uh, with great care uh, the book by Alexander Rose, uh, Washington Spies, upon which it is based. And that is a great book, which is a huge help to me. And uh, so I, I'm afraid I can't uh, speak uh, about turn, but um, you know, I'm sure it's got its own take. Uh, again, a really excellent presentation, I thought. Uh, what happened to Benedict Arnold's children? Did they have to leave the country, or did they change their last name, or yeah. how did they end up? Well, uh, no, they, you know, it's his, he, they would have quite a few children, and uh, eventually Arnold, they would go to England. You know, Arnold was a traitor, and so he was not embraced by the English. And uh, eventually he would end up uh, in Canada, a, a trader, a, a trader, you know, a merchant, uh, trying to, you know, regain some of his fortune. And he was largely unsuccessful in all that. But his children would, uh, just about every son would go into the military and serve with great distinction uh, in the British military and, and, you know, do not seem to have been, you know, in any way uh, limited by, by their by their paternity. Uh, I was in London this, this winter and um, uh, went to Berkeley Square uh, in the house where Arnold lived. It's now a dentist office. Um, and, uh, you know, and it was a very sad, it was sad because Arnold, uh, it did not go well for Arnold. And uh, he, he, uh, he would end up, uh, Peggy would end up in London. She, he would remain in Canada for a while. He took up with a mistress. Uh, and then he came back, and then when he eventually died, uh, Peggy was left with these crushing debts. But Peggy, yes, but Peggy uh, was a remarkably strong woman and would uh, work her way through all that. And uh, her, her son spoke of her with great reverence uh, for her, um, you know, her strength and the, the, the trials that she had to live with. But uh, it was you know, a, tough, a tough aftermath. Did your research lead you to Mount Pleasant, one of the historical houses in Philmont Park that um, Benedict Arnold owned? Yes. But never actually lived in? Exactly. Well, you know, and this is great. I mean, thank you for, for that. I owe you. Um, <laughs> Because my time in Philadelphia was just fascinating. This, you know, uh, the, the connections this city has to this story are amazing. You know, there's Fort Mifflin, where the airport is. Uh, there's uh, um, one of my character, the characters in this is Joseph Plum Martin, a, a uh, young continental soldier, and he's there slugging out. It's great. But Mount Pleasant, I mean, this beautiful home, uh, ship, Mr. Shippen uh, made it clear that if Arnold was going to marry Peggy, he had to give them evidence that he, he had the money 
to make sure that she could live in the style to which she was great. So Arnold, even though he didn't really have the money at this time, was in the middle of all sorts of deals, and he was able to take out a crushing mortgage, a loan, and bought Mount Pleasant, which John Adams described as, I think, the most impressive residence in Philadelphia. And unfortunately, he didn't have the the money to live there. Uh, he, he had to keep the tenant there who was a, a Spanish, if not an ambassador, an emissary. And so they never lived there. Uh, but that was, that was going to be her legacy, no matter what happened to him. And, um, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, this was, you know, just evidence of how far Arnold had stretched himself when it came to all this. And, you know, another incident here uh, in Philadelphia that had huge importance to Arnold. You know, when he initiated his correspondence uh, with, with Andre, uh, it broke off qu quite early. And it looked like he wasn't, you know, he had lost interest. And it's clear that Peggy was like, oh, come on, Arnold. Uh, you know, because Arnold was, had said, well, Clinton, if I'm going to give you information, you've got to give me information about what you plan to do. And Clinton said, what? I'm not going to do that. And thin-skinned Arnold said, well, then the heck with you, and broke it off. And, uh, you know, Peggy sort of, okay, let's wait it out. And then it was in the fall of 1779, things in Philadelphia are getting very bad, where the radical constitutional, to, constitutionalists are, um, the militiamen are, are basically a strong arm group of, of the constitutionalists, and they're breaking up political rallies for the conservative Republicans. I mean, this is going on. And then finally, it comes to a head when uh, the, the conservative uh, uh, lawyer and judge James Wilson, you know, one of Pennsylvania's finest jurists, um, his home is attacked by a group of militiamen who are rounding up the, the, the children and spouses of exiled loyalists with the intention of sending them to New York. They're going into people's homes, dragging them out, and they're, they're parading them through the streets, and they're working their way towards uh, uh, Wilson's house, which is at the corner of Third and Walnut Street. And, um, and Wilson's in there barricaded with some other fellow politicians and Continental officers. And so the Continental officers are forced to defend the conservatives from the militiamen and the radical popul uh, politicians. The, the, the militiamen march by uh, the, uh, Wilson's house. A Continental officer up in an upper story window opens the door, says some words to a militiaman who turns, shoots at him, he shoots, the Continental officer is killed, uh, hail of bullets, soon the militiamen are pounding down the door, burst into the residence, militiamen are killed, it's a melee, you know, Americans are killing Americans, and Joseph Reed hears about this, rides his horse, breaks it up, but as he will dis later dismiss it as the, casu the deaths, as the casual overflowings of liberty, liberty. Arnold arrives late on the scene, and he can't ride a horse yet. His leg is so badly injured that he comes in a carriage, and not the most dignified way to, you know, come to the rescue. You know, he goes to the top of the building, and, but by then it's pretty much died down. And then his carriage is besieged by an angry mob. And, uh, you know, he writes a letter to the Congress, since the state of Pennsylvania isn't willing to defend me from these people, please give me some soldiers to defend my my safety, and they say, no way, and it's day after days after this, Peggy, through a letter to Andre, restarts the correspondence, and, um, and that seems to have had a big factor in, in leading, and so this city uh, really is, is just an absolutely essential part uh, in this story. If you weren't uh, writing about the American Revolution right now, what uh characters or episodes or eras of American history would really intrigue you as uh, book material? Well, you know, I have, um, that's, that's a good question, one that I ask myself all the time, and I have a lot of readers who have suggestions about what I should do, which I really appreciate. Um, but, you know, for me, these books 
uh, work organically uh, from one another. And you know, the other thing I always have, you know, there's, I'm a sailor, so there's always something maritime I'm, I'm sneaking into my books. You know, even you know, my book about the Battle of L Little Bighorn begins on a riverboat <laughs> going up the Missouri River. And um, because I, I just think that is an underappreciated part of American history. You know, we think a wilderness defined this country, but it's, you know, it's not just the Wild West. Um, it's the sea was the first wilderness. And, um, and so I'm always trying to work all that in. But uh, you know, I know with my next book, I'm going to head south and finish this revolution. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, there's an, uh, an amazing naval battle, underappreciated nat under naval battle called the Battle of the Chesapeake that made Yorktown virtual fait accompli. Americans weren't involved in it at all. It was fought between the French and the British. And, um, and so I've, you know, I'm, I'm, this is really getting my, my maritime um, hackles up in a good way. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But beyond that, I don't know. I, I, I really enjoyed my time west. Uh, I took four years to write um, the, the Last Stand. And for me, I write these books not because I know everything about the topic. I write them because I, I want to know everything about them. I want to, I, I have questions about them. I want to, I want to learn. And so it's a, an act of discovery as much for me as it is hopefully the reader. And, and, um, and what I see each book as is kind of a, a chapter in uh, my gradual working through the story of America. And so I know the Civil War is something I'm very interested in. Uh, you know, you can't go be in Virginia as I've been recently this winter doing some legwork for my next book. And you know, if it's a Revolutionary War site, it's also a Civil War site. And you know, and that's the underappreciated fact. Uh, yes, we fought the American Revolution, but we didn't settle it by any means. You know, the whole issue of slavery uh, was the, the, the great un-dealt un, uh, with question. And there would be the Civil War. And I, and I think the civil unrest that was inherent in the revolution uh, is the unappreciated reality of what was going to break out almost 100 years later. Uh, Mr. Fulbrick, I was uh, looking at your uh, preference and uh, your preface and uh, it's, uh, you mentioned in it that Charles Thompson, who was the Secretary of the Continental Congress and uh, who was intimately familiar with uh, many of the people associated with the revolution, uh, had dis destroyed his uh, manuscript as a me of his memoirs. And I was wondering if uh, there's anything uh, from primary, from available in primary sources uh, related to Charles Thompson that you would recommend for reading? Yeah, well, this is uh, an episode, I uh, thank you. Uh, that was an episode that's in the preface where, you know, America, uh, the, the mythology machine went in full time right after the American Revolution. No one wanted to talk about how ugly and messy it had been. And so um, uh, by the early 19th century, um, it was, you know, the generals involved, it was, the mythology was that it was, um, uh, the, it was a, a, a undisciplined, pugnacious group of citizen soldiers, militiamen, had ra ra rallied together and somehow defeated the greatest military power on earth and unseated British tyranny. And that was the storyline, even though, you know, that's, was nowhere close to the reality of what the people had lived. And Thompson uh, was the, the secretary of the Continental Congress, which meant that as presidents of the Continental Congress came and went, he was always there. Um, one historian has compared him to uh, the, the prime minister of, of our prime minister during the, the, the most earliest and most crucial stage of our national legislature. And after his, his stint, he decided he was going to write a memoir of his time and tell the story of what really happened behind the doors of the Continental Congress because there's really very little evidence. Most of them were conducted pretty much in secret. You know, there was resolutions and things like that, but there's all sorts of very animated conversations uh, uh, that occurred. And Thompson you know, he called it the, you know, history of the conflicts, arguments, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, stuff. And he realized, 
and by this time, the star maker machinery had kicked in. You know, biographies were coming out that painted every, everything in an angelic light. And he realized, if I publish this, it will contradict everything the American people are being told. And, you know, he agonized over it, and he finally decided it was not for him to tear back the veil and reveal what actually happened. Uh, which is, oh, as a historian, you just, oh, man, why didn't you do this? I mean, there, are, there, are, there is a wonderful resource. It's the uh, letters of, of the, the delegates to the Continental Congress, um, and there's multi-volumes of them. And it's through their correspondence that you get uh, are revealed some of these real, I mean, just, they would go at it. You know, we think we have a dysfunctional Congress. <laughs> You know, in the, uh, in the 1770s and 80s, uh, you know, the, it was partisanship. It was uh, factionalism. The, the New Englanders and the, the, and the Virginia delegates ganged up on the, the more conservative delegates from the middle states. And, you know, they would wrangle over personalities. It drove Washington crazy. You know, focus on what we need to know rather than your own personal vendettas. Sound familiar? And, um, you know, but the, and it was tough because the Continental Congress did not have the power really to lead the country. They did not have the ability to raise funds in a significant way. You know, they, they didn't have an executive branch in our government. And thank goodness we had the Constitutional Convention here in Philadelphia to create what we have now. And I'll just finish with, you know, I, I think there is a tendency to look back on the past as a simpler time as a time when uh, like the likes of Washington and Franklin you know, knew what they wanted to accomplish and had the strength and vision to do exactly that. It was nothing like that. They were making it up as they went along. <laughs> they were, Washington did not have a free hand in this. He was beleaguered, um, uh, confused at times, doing the best he could, but it was by no means a fait accompli. Um, you know, reality is the same in every age. It's, you know, it's, we're muddling through as best we can. And uh, to those, you know, there's the old saw that, you know, the, those who don't know the past are doomed to repeat it. I'm, I'm afraid those who know the past are doomed to repeat it. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, when you're living life, when you are living in this moment, you don't have the blessings of hindsight. You, you're, you know, you're, you're just responding to this whole array of things going on and have no clue where it's going to lead. In a hundred years, they're going to look at our age and say, what were they thinking? Uh, just as we look back at, at our own past and say, how could they have done this? Didn't they see they made the Civil War an inevitability? No, it's not the way you live life. And so my one plea, and it's really a message in all my books, is that we look to the past, yes, there are lessons to be learned, but I'm afraid there's the only thing you can take away from the past is humility uh, when it comes to how we lead our own lives. Thank you very much.